During World War II, the German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, committed severe war crimes that have left a lasting mark on history. This troubling period reveals acts of brutality extending beyond aerial combat, exposing a systematic campaign of violence. As we explore historical records, we discover distressing stories of bombings on civilian populations, deliberate attacks on non-combatants, and the horrors of strategic air raids. Join us as we delve into exposing the Nazi war crimes of the Luftwaffe during World War II. The secret genesis of the Luftwaffe in Soviet shadows. In World War II, the German Air Force, called the Luftwaffe, had a crucial role as the airborne component of the Wehrmacht. After World War I, Germany's air forces were grounded due to the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, which prohibited any air force activities. The once powerful Imperial Army and Imperial Navy air forces were disbanded in 1920. However, in the interwar period, there was a hidden effort at the Lipetsk Air Base in the Soviet Union, where German pilots secretly trained in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles. This secret training laid the groundwork for the future Luftwaffe. The official establishment of the Luftwaffe occurred on February 26, 1935, just before the grand announcement of German rearmament and conscription on March 16. The rise of the Nazi party led to the Luftwaffe emerging from the shadows. The Luftwaffe's first combat experience took place during the Spanish Civil War, when the Condor Legion, a detachment supporting nationalist forces, tested innovative tactics and advanced aircraft. This experience positioned the Luftwaffe as a sophisticated and technologically advanced force when World War II began on September 1939. By the summer of that year, the Luftwaffe had 28 wings, showcasing their aerial strength. In addition to traditional warfare, the Luftwaffe included a paratrooper force called the Fallschirmjäger, adding a daring dimension to their capabilities. The stage was set for the Luftwaffe to play a crucial role in the turbulent era of World War II, where the skies became their canvas and history bore witness to their actions. You see, the Imperial German Army Air Service stands out as a pioneering force that took flight in the early 20th century. Established in 1910 as Die Fliegertruppen der Deutschen Kaiserreiches, the force aimed to dominate the skies. However, a significant transformation occurred leading to its reconstitution as the formidable Luftstreitkräfte on October 8, 1916. The Western Front became a battleground for aerial prowess, featuring legendary figures like Manfred von Richthofen, Ernst Udet, Oswald Bolke, and Max Immelmann. Their aerial exploits during the Great War turned them into celebrated aces and icons in the emerging realm of military aviation. As the echoes of war faded and the Treaty of Versailles took effect, a crucial moment unfolded on May 8, 1920. The Imperial German Air Service, once a symbol of strength, yielded to the treaty's demands. Versailles not only led to the service's dissolution, but also mandated the destruction of all German military aircraft, leaving the skies quiet over a subdued Germany. Despite the stifling terms of the treaty, German aviators embarked on a covert journey. Prohibited from having an air force, they operated in the shadows, concealing their activities. The initial phase of this clandestine effort took place in civil aviation schools across Germany, where lightweight trainers disguised as potential civil airline pilots took to the skies for training under the guise of Deutsche Lufthansa. However, this was just the beginning. To enhance their skills in aerial combat, Germany turned to an unexpected ally, the Soviet Union. In 1924, a covert training airfield emerged in Lipetsk, operating for almost a decade as a secret hub for aviation excellence. It hosted a mix of Dutch, Soviet, and German training aircraft, officially posing as the 4th Squadron of the 40th Wing of the Red Army. The hidden collaboration between Germany and the Soviet Union unfolded during a period of political isolation. For approximately nine years, this covert airfield served as a training ground for hundreds of Luftwaffe pilots and technical personnel. These individuals were not mere visitors. They were students learning the intricacies of aviation from Soviet Air Force schools in central Russia. The roster of future Luftwaffe aces who refined their skills in the covert collaboration of Soviet German schools is extensive. 
Names like Rosing, Bloom, Fosse, Tietzeman, Heine, Makratsky, and Blumendot resonate in the annals of history, each a testament to the silent partnership under the watchful patronage of Ernst August Kostring, building the Luftwaffe from ideology to power. The early stages of the Luftwaffe's formation took shape following Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany. This crucial period witnessed the collaboration of visionary minds in the field of aviation, with Hermann Göring, a distinguished World War I ace, emerging as a key figure. Göring, appointed as the National Commissar for Aviation, partnered with Erhard Milch, a seasoned former director of Lufthansa, who became Göring's deputy. The formalization of their efforts occurred on April 1933 with the establishment of the Reich Aviation Ministry, or Reichsluftfahrt Ministerium. This ministry was tasked with overseeing the development and production of aircraft, becoming the focal point for aviation ambitions. Goering wielded significant influence, consolidating control over all aspects of aviation and ensuring absolute authority. A pivotal moment in this story unfolded on March 25, 1933, when the German Air Sports Association absorbed various private and national organizations. Despite retaining the seemingly innocent title of sports, a significant transformation was underway. By May 15, 1933, all military aviation organizations under the RLM umbrella merged to officially form the Luftwaffe, a name that would echo through history as its official birthday. In 1937, the National Socialist Flyers Corps was established to offer flying training to young men before military service and involve adult sport aviators in the Nazi movement. This organization served as a link between recreational flying and military duty. When NSFK members of military age joined the Luftwaffe, there was a seamless connection between their ideological commitment and flying skills. Notably, all NSFK members were also supporters of the Nazi party, contributing to the Luftwaffe's strong Nazi ideological foundation, distinguishing it from the army and navy. Hermann Göring played a crucial role in building the Luftwaffe from 1933 to 1936. However, his direct involvement diminished after 1936, with Erhard Milch taking on the ministerial role until 1937. Milch, with his steady hand in aviation development, guided the Luftwaffe through its early years, shaping it into a formidable force for the challenges ahead. The fortunate absence of Göring in planning and production matters was due to his limited knowledge of contemporary aviation, lack of recent flying experience, and failure to stay updated on the latest developments. Göring also lacked an understanding of the doctrine and technical aspects of aerial warfare, leaving these responsibilities to more competent individuals. After 1936, Erhard Milch took charge of organizing and building the Luftwaffe, while Göring, being part of Hitler's inner circle, facilitated access to financial resources and equipment for the rearmament of the Luftwaffe. Helmut Wilberg was a key figure in the development of German air power. He played a significant role in shaping German air doctrine after leading the Reichswehr air staff for eight years in the 1920s. Due to his extensive experience, he was a strong candidate for a senior staff position. Initially considered for the role of chief of staff by Göring, it was later revealed that Wilberg had a Jewish mother. Consequently, Göring couldn't appoint him as CS due to the racial policies of Nazi Germany. However, Göring, recognizing Wilberg's talent, ensured that these policies wouldn't prevent him from contributing. Wilberg continued to serve on the air staff and, under Walter Weaver, played a key role in developing the Luftwaffe's fundamental doctrinal texts, namely the conduct of the aerial war and Regulation 16. The Luftwaffe's dominance in the early years of World War II. In the year 1939, when World War II kicked off, the Luftwaffe stood out as one of the top-notch air forces globally, boasting cutting-edge technology. As the war ignited with the Polish campaign, the Luftwaffe swiftly seized control of the skies, first achieving air superiority and then escalating to air supremacy. This swift dominance played a pivotal role in wrapping up the campaign in merely five weeks, as it collaborated seamlessly with the German army. 
During this campaign, the Luftwaffe, under the watchful eye of Goering, performed exceptionally well, providing crucial support to the ground troops by eliminating pockets of resistance. Despite facing some command and control challenges, both the Army and the Luftwaffe showcased remarkable adaptability and quick thinking to tackle these issues. Notably, the Luftwaffe had a ground-to-air communication system in place, a key factor in the success of the 1940s Fall Gelb. Moving ahead to the spring of 1940, the Luftwaffe played a significant role in the invasion of Norway, offering aerial support to the Kriegsmarine and Heer. Through flying in reinforcements and securing air superiority, the Luftwaffe played a decisive role in the triumph of the German forces during this invasion. In the subsequent months of May and June 1940, the Luftwaffe continued its impressive performance, contributing to the unexpected success of the Germans in the Battle of France. This included the destruction of three Allied air forces and ultimately led to the defeat of France in just a little over six weeks. However, despite intense bombing efforts, the Luftwaffe fell short of obliterating the British Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk, allowing the BEF to escape and continue the fight. In the scorching summer of 1940, the Battle of Britain unfolded, where the Luftwaffe unleashed considerable damage upon Britain's Royal Air Force. Despite their relentless assaults, they fell short of achieving the air superiority that Hitler eagerly sought for a potential invasion of Britain. This invasion plan, initially set for execution, faced postponements and eventual cancellation on December 1940. Undeterred, the Luftwaffe then turned its fury towards British cities during the Blitz of 1940-1941. However, the spirited resilience of the British people endured, with the RAF managing to shoot down German planes at a ratio of over 2 to 1. As the year 1941 unfolded, the Luftwaffe extended its support to Axis ally Italy, aiding in securing victory in the Balkans campaign. This support continued across the Mediterranean, Middle East and African theaters until May 1945. On June 1941, Germany initiated Operation Barbarossa, invading the Soviet Union. Despite causing significant losses to the Soviet Air Force, the Luftwaffe fell short of obliterating it. A crucial strategic deficiency emerged, as the Luftwaffe lacked the much-needed strategic bombers, known as the Ural Bombers, that Weber had envisioned six years prior. This absence hindered the Luftwaffe's ability to consistently and forcefully strike at Soviet production centers. The ensuing air operations during Operation Barbarossa witnessed a staggering toll on both sides in terms of men and planes. As the war progressed, the Luftwaffe's strength gradually waned. Defeats at pivotal battles, such as Stalingrad in 1942 and Kursk in 1943, marked a turning point in the Eastern Front, contributing to the broader decline of the Wehrmacht. According to British historian Frederick Taylor, the grim reality of World War II saw cities on all sides suffering from devastating bombings. Approximately half a million Soviet citizens lost their lives due to German bombings during the invasion and occupation of Russia, a toll eerily similar to the number of German citizens who perished in Allied air raids. As the conflict unfolded, the Luftwaffe found itself defending German-occupied Europe against the growing might of RAF Bomber Command. And, from the summer of 1942 onward, the steadily strengthening United States Army Air Forces. The intense demands of the Defense of the Reich campaign gradually took a toll on the Luftwaffe's fighter arm. Despite attempting to catch up with advanced turbojet and rocket-propelled aircraft for bomber-destroyer duties, the Luftwaffe faced insurmountable challenges in terms of Allied numerical superiority, a shortage of trained pilots, and insufficient fuel. A desperate final effort, known as Operation Bodenplatt, aimed at securing air superiority on January 1, 1945, ultimately failed, marking the point where the Luftwaffe ceased to function as an effective fighting force. Aerial Combat and the Toll of the Skies in World War II Throughout World War II, German day- and night fighter pilots claimed an astounding 70,000 aerial victories. Among these triumphs, Messerschmitt Me 262 jet fighters were credited with approximately 745 victories. The formidable anti-aircraft artillery, known as FLAC, 
managed to shoot down 25 to 30,000 Allied planes. Breaking down these losses by different Allied forces, approximately 25,000 were American planes, 20,000 were British, 46,100 were Soviet, 1,274 were French, 375 were Polish, and 81 were Dutch, along with aircraft from various other Allied nationalities. The skies bore witness to the intense struggle for control, with each side paying a high price in the air war. In the annals of aerial combat during World War II, certain German pilots soared to remarkable heights in terms of achievements. The highest-scoring day fighter pilot, Eric Hartmann, etched his name in history with an astounding 352 confirmed kills, all of them on the Eastern Front against the Soviets. On the Western Front, aces like Hans Joachim Marseille, with 158 kills primarily against British Commonwealth forces in the Desert Campaign, and Georg Peter Eder, with 56 kills of USAAF aircraft, stood out as leading figures. Heinz Wolfgang Schnaufer earned his place as the most successful night fighter pilot, credited with an impressive 121 kills. The German fighter pilot's collective prowess was staggering, with 103 of them achieving over 100 aerial victories, amounting to roughly 15,400 successes. Additionally, around 360 pilots claimed between 40 and 100 aerial victories, contributing to a total of approximately 21,000 victories. Another 500 fighter pilots secured between 20 and 40 victories, adding up to 15,000 more victories. Notably, German pilots often remained in combat for the duration of the war, in contrast to their allied counterparts who rotated in and out to recuperate and train others. This difference in approach contributed to the remarkable individual success of German pilots. The accolades for their achievements were numerous, with 2,500 German fighter pilots attaining ace status, having scored at least five aerial victories. The prestigious Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross was awarded to 453 German single and twin-engine day fighter pilots, with an additional 85 night fighter pilots receiving this honor, including 14 crew members. Beyond day fighter pilots, bomber pilots also left their mark. Hans Ulrich Rudel, a Stuka and Schlachtflieger pilot, flew an incredible 2,530 ground attack missions and claimed the destruction of over 519 tanks and even a battleship, becoming the most decorated German serviceman of the Second World War. Hans Georg Batcher, a bomber pilot, completed more than 658 combat missions, showcasing his prowess in destroying numerous ships and other targets. However, the impressive achievements of the Luftwaffe were accompanied by significant losses. The total estimated number of destroyed and damaged aircraft during the war reached a staggering 76,875. Of these, approximately 43,000 were lost in combat, while the remainder succumbed to operational accidents and training mishaps. The breakdown by type included 21,452 fighters, 12,037 bombers, 15,428 trainers, 10,221 twin-engine fighters, 5,548 ground attack craft, 6,733 reconnaissance planes, and 6,141 transports. The toll on both sides of the conflict underscored the intensity and ferocity of the aerial battles during World War II. Luftwaffe's involvement in war crimes across Europe. During the grim years of 1943 and 1944, as the Axis powers faced growing challenges in World War II, a dark chapter unfolded as aircraft production shifted to concentration camps. This move aimed to address labor shortages and shield production facilities from the relentless air raids carried out by the Allies. Notably, the two largest aircraft factories emerged within the confines of the mauthausen gusen and mittelbau dora concentration camps. Across various concentration camps like Flossenburg, Buchenwald, Dachau, Ravensbrück, Grossrosen, Natzweiler, Herzogenbusch, and Neuengamme, aircraft parts were manufactured. Astonishingly, in 1944 and 1945, as many as 90,000 concentration prisoners toiled in the aviation industry, 
constituting approximately one-tenth of the concentration camp population during the harsh winter of 1944-45. The demand for forced labor in response to the Luftwaffe's need to ramp up fighter production led to a drastic expansion of concentration camps. Between mid-1943 and mid-1944, the camp population more than doubled, reaching 524,000, with the Jägerstab program justifying the deportation of Hungarian Jews to meet this demand. Tragically, of the 437,000 Hungarian Jews deported between May and July 1944, around 320,000 faced immediate death upon arrival at Auschwitz, and only 5,000 managed to survive the ordeal. Mauthausen, specifically its brutal subcamp Gusen, played a macabre role in the production of almost 1,000 fuselages for the jet fighter Messerschmitt Me-262. The average life expectancy of those forced to work in Gusen was a mere six months. Additionally, a significant portion of the BF-109 production, the backbone of the Luftwaffe fighter arm, originated from Gusen and Flossenburg by 1944. The exploitation extended beyond aircraft production. In a disturbing operation named Operation Desert, prisoners in Mittelbau Dora were compelled to produce synthetic oil from shale oil deposits, an attempt to compensate for decreased oil production caused by Allied bombing. Tragically, over 3,500 individuals lost their lives during this operation. Even Luftwaffe airfields were not spared from the use of forced labor. Inmates from subcamps of Stutthof were deployed to maintain these airfields, and prisoners from various concentration camps and ghettos were conscripted to construct or upkeep airfields and bases near their locations. The Luftwaffe's grim involvement extended to bomb defusing, as prisoners from Buchenwald and Herzogenbusch were forced to deal with unexploded bombs around Dusseldorf and Leovarden on the orders of the Luftwaffe. Complicit in these atrocities were thousands of Luftwaffe personnel who served as concentration camp guards. Auschwitz, for instance, housed a munitions factory guarded by Luftwaffe soldiers, while Buchenwald had 2,700 of Luftwaffe personnel working as guards. Camps and subcamps, primarily managed by Luftwaffe soldiers, were instrumental in armaments production. As personnel shortages became acute, many Luftwaffe soldiers were transferred to concentration camps in 1944. This horrifying convergence of wartime demands and human suffering stands as a stark reminder of the depths to which exploitation and brutality can sink during armed conflicts. The actions of Luftwaffe paratroopers during and after the Battle of Crete and in various regions of Europe bear a dark and brutal legacy, marked by numerous war crimes. In Crete, following their victory, Luftwaffe paratroopers engaged in atrocities such as the Alekianos executions, the massacre of Condomari, and the raising of Candanos. These events, stained with violence and cruelty, showcased the grim aftermath of the battle. Expanding their reign of terror beyond Crete, Luftwaffe divisions, including the 1st Parachute Division, 2nd Parachute Division, 4th Parachute Division, 19th Luftwaffe Field Division, 20th Luftwaffe Field Division, and the 1st Fallschirm Panzer Division committed war crimes in Italy, leading to the senseless murder of hundreds of civilians. These acts of brutality further exemplified the destructive impact of war on innocent lives. Tragically, Luftwaffe troops were also implicated in the Holocaust, participating in the systematic extermination of Jews in Eastern Europe. In places like the Nemirov Ghetto, they played a role in the murder of 2,680 Jews, the Opatno ghetto witnessed a series of massacres facilitated by Luftwaffe troops, and they contributed to the liquidation of the Deblin Irina ghetto by deporting thousands of Jews to the Treblinka extermination camp. Throughout 1942 to 1944, two Luftwaffe security battalions stationed in the Bialoisa forest were involved in Bandenbekampfung operations, encouraged by Göring. These operations resulted in the killing of thousands of Jews and other civilians. Additionally, Luftwaffe soldiers in Eastern Europe engaged in the arbitrary execution of Polish civilians, often making baseless accusations of being Bolshevik agents. These executions were carried out to instill fear in the population, maintain control, or act as reprisals for partisan activities. 
The success of these troops was measured by the body count of those murdered. In total, around 10,000 Luftwaffe troops were stationed on the Eastern Front for such anti-partisan operations, contributing to the grim toll of lives lost in the name of brutality and suppression. These reprehensible actions underscore the profound moral cost of war and the tragic consequences of unchecked power. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Let's delve into exposing the Nazi war crimes of the Luftwaffe during World War II. You see, the horrific treatment of concentration camp prisoners during World War II extended to becoming involuntary subjects in a series of disturbing experiments conducted by the Luftwaffe. Some of these experiments were orchestrated by Luftwaffe personnel, while others were carried out under the orders of the Oberkommando der Luftwaffe. In 1941, to understand how to prevent and treat hypothermia, experiments were conducted for the benefit of the Luftwaffe. These trials took place at Dachau and Auschwitz, and the focus was on addressing the issue of immersion hypothermia experienced by aircrew after ditchings. Sigmund Rascher, a Luftwaffe doctor stationed at Dachau, spearheaded these experiments, and their outcomes were presented at the 1942 medical conference titled Medical Problems Arising from Sea and Winter. Shockingly, about 400 prisoners were forced to participate in cold water experiments, leading to the tragic death of 80 to 90 individuals. In the early months of 1942, Rascher extended his gruesome experiments to perfecting ejection seats at high altitudes. Prisoners at Dachau were used as test subjects, confined in a low-pressure chamber to simulate conditions at altitudes of up to 20,000 meters. Disturbing rumors circulated about Rascher performing vivisections on the brains of victims who managed to survive the initial experiment. Out of the 200 subjects, 80 lost their lives due to the experimentation, and the remaining individuals were executed. Adding to the catalog of atrocities, Eugen Hagen, head doctor of the Luftwaffe, resorted to infecting inmates at Natzweiler concentration camp with typhus. The purpose was to test the effectiveness of proposed vaccines, with the lives of prisoners being used as mere pawns in these inhumane experiments. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Civilian devastation in Belgrade and international missions in the 21st century. The absence of positive or specific customary international humanitarian law regarding aerial warfare before and during World War II contributed to the lack of prosecution for Luftwaffe officers at the post-World War II Allied war crime trials related to aerial raids. This legal vacuum underscored the challenges in holding individuals accountable for actions that, while morally reprehensible, were not explicitly regulated by established international laws at the time. One poignant example of the devastating impact of aerial warfare during this period is the bombing of Wielan, a Polish town, by the Luftwaffe on September 1939. The air raid commenced at 4.40, just five minutes before the shelling of Westerplatte, often regarded as the start of World War II in Europe. This early wartime event marked one of the first instances of aerial bombings during the conflict. Tragically, approximately 1,300 civilians lost their lives, hundreds were injured, and 90% of the town center was obliterated. The casualty rate surpassed that of the infamous Guernica bombing. Disturbingly, a 1989 Sender Fries Berlin documentary highlighted that there were no apparent military or industrial targets in the area, except for a small sugar factory on the outskirts of town. Notably, it was claimed that German bombers prioritized the destruction of the town's hospital. Attempts to prosecute individuals responsible for the bombing of the Wieland Hospital in 1978 and 1983 faced dismissal by West German judges, as prosecutors argued that pilots were unable to discern the nature of the structure due to fog, highlighting the complexities of attributing responsibility in the absence of clear legal frameworks. Operation Retribution, conducted on April 1941, stands as a chilling testament to the brutality of war, as German forces bombed Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia, during the early days of the Axis invasion. This deliberate targeting of civilians as a form of punishment led to a devastating toll, with an estimated 17,000 civilian lives lost. The operation unfolded from April 6 to 7 or 8, 
marking a dark chapter in the German-led Axis invasion of Yugoslavia. The bombing had a profound impact on both civilian and military infrastructure in Belgrade. The Luftwaffe's relentless assault paralyzed Yugoslav command and control, leaving widespread destruction in the city center and inflicting significant casualties among the civilian population. Key targets included the Royal Palace, War Ministry, Military Headquarters, Central Post Office, Telegraph Office, Railway Stations, Power Stations, and Barracks. The sheer magnitude of the bombing was staggering, with the report revealing that 218.5 metric tons of bombs, including 10 to 14 percent incendiaries, were dropped on the city. Notably, seven aerial mines were used, adding to the devastation. The aftermath of Operation Retribution left areas in the center and northwest of the city in ruins, comprising 20 to 25 percent of its total area. However, some aspects of the bombing, such as the use of aerial mines, remain shrouded in mystery. According to Pavlovich, nearly 50% of housing in Belgrade was destroyed during this brutal operation. Following the invasion and the Yugoslav capitulation, the German forces subjected the Jewish population to further cruelty by forcing between 3,500 and 4,000 Jews to collect rubble resulting from the bombing. This added a painful and degrading layer to the already devastating consequences of Operation Retribution. The horror of deliberately targeting civilians in wartime extends beyond Yugoslavia. The Battle of Britain witnessed the Luftwaffe's extensive attacks on the British Isles, primarily hitting non-military targets. The result was a staggering loss of civilian lives, with over 22,000 people killed and more than 30,000 wounded underscoring the tragic toll of such indiscriminate bombing campaigns on innocent populations caught in the crossfire of conflict. The Luftwaffe underwent a significant rebirth and transformation in the aftermath of World War II. After Germany's unconditional surrender in 1945, the Luftwaffe was dissolved as part of post-war agreements and disarmament policies. Prohibitions on having an air force were in place for nearly a decade, the pivotal moment came in 1955 when the Federal Republic of Germany became a sovereign state and joined NATO. This marked the beginning of the reformed German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, inheriting its name from its predecessor, despite the historical baggage associated with it. In the early years, the reformed Luftwaffe focused on establishing a defensive air capability aligned with NATO's strategic needs. The introduction of advanced aircraft like the American-made F-84 Thunderjet and later the F-104 Starfighter represented a new era in German aviation, transitioning from propeller-driven planes of the World War II era to modern air warfare. However, the F-104 Starfighter, known as the Widowmaker, faced controversy due to a high number of crashes, prompting questions about the haste in rebuilding the Luftwaffe. The 1960s and 1970s saw continued growth and modernization of the Luftwaffe, with the introduction of aircraft like the F-4 Phantom II and the Tornado in the 1980s, further enhancing its capabilities. The Luftwaffe transitioned from a purely defensive posture to actively participating in international missions, signifying a more active role in global security. The Eurofighter Typhoon, introduced in the early 2000s, exemplified modernization with advanced technology and multi-role capabilities. The Luftwaffe's involvement in international missions continued, marking a significant departure from its past. In the 1990s, it participated in operations in the Balkans, enforcing no-fly zones and providing humanitarian aid. This role persisted into the 21st century with involvement in Afghanistan and the fight against ISIS, reflecting Germany's commitment to international peacekeeping and security. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.